I just, you know, having a break from, from Sunday school with Vacation Bible School, which, which I think went very well. Um, so today we're going to go over an overview of, of Galatians. It's, it's a new letter that we're going to go over. We fin- finished up Titus. We're going to go over Galatians. And then after Galatians, which, which will take us a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll hit James. I've never studied James before, um, so we'll all learn together. Um, and then probably to round out the spring, we'll finish up or we'll start, um, I forgot, I think it was Colossians is what I said we we're going to study. So we'll go Gal- Galatians, James, and then Colossians. Um, and then that'll, you know, we'll, it, that'll give me a little bit of time to think about what, what we can study next. And I asked Pastor Jeff about David Jeremiah, um, what, what his thoughts are, because there's a study that, we, that David Jeremiah is a, a pretty good pastor. Um, a reputable one and, and a tr- trustworthy one that I'm going to look at some a study book on the first and second letter of Peter um, that that we could uh, we could potentially go over in the future as well. But before we start, let's first go into the word of prayer, and then um, I was going to read a psalm, or I guess have you guys read a psalm uh, that that uh, I don't know just kind of spoke to me this week. But let's go ahead and go to go to the Lord in prayer, Heavenly Father. Almighty God, we thank you, Lord, for, for blessing us with another day here at church. Thank you, God, that uh, you blessed our time at Vacation Bible School last weekend. Lord, I pray, God, that, that whatever seeds were planted, God, that, they, that they're cultivated and that they grow um, into a strong oak, Lord. And for this study today, as we, as we begin to look in Galatians, I pray, God, that, uh, that you open up your word to us, uh, that there's some things in here that, that are hard to go over. Um, this is a very fiery letter, Lord, and, and uh, I, I pray, God, that you help me uh, with, with being able to, to discern what it is that, that through Paul that you wanted to share with us, God. I pray that you be with uh, Chris, too, as he gives the overview, uh, the second half of it. Um, and just thank you, God, for, for his ability to, to step in and, and uh, just do some, some good research to help us understand the context of this letter. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's all go to Psalm uh, 77. Let's go to Psalm 77. Now remember, some of the Psalms are written by David. Some of them are written by, the majority of them are written, uh, I'd say half are written by David. The other half is written by a guy by the name of Asaph. Um... But this is the first time where I've read this, and it says, uh, it, it, my, my Bible shows in the beginning of Psalm 77, it says, For the choir director, according to Jeduthun. And I think I said that right. Jeduthun. Is, is it, anybody else have that in their Bible too? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm not the only one. That's good. And then it says, A Psalm of Asaph. So when I read that, I'm like, okay, we know that Asaph wrote this, and then he gave it to apparently the choir director. Jeduthun. So I went in a little Bible encyclopedia that we got. I was curious, like, all right, who, who are these two dudes? All right, so Jeduthun is a personal name meaning praise. He was a prophetic musician and Levite in the service of King David. And we get that from 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1. So that's where his name is mentioned. Um, it also says uh, that he is said to have prophesied using musical instruments, which is referred to in 2 Chron- Chronicles chapter 35, verse 15. And he is referred to as the king Ser. So, pretty interesting. All right, so we know that, that this guy, you know, uh, was pretty important. He was King David's, uh, you know, musician. Um, all right, and then Asaph, who that guy is. All right, so personal name meaning he collected. Uh, he was the father, or I'm sorry, was, uh, he was a Levite musician that David appointed to serve in the tabernacle until the temple was completed. And that's referencing 1 Chronicles chapter 6, uh, verse 39. Uh, he had part of the musical responsibility, including sounding the cymbals. Uh, and David established the tradition of delivering psalms to Asaph for the temple singers to sing. Uh, Asaph and the singers ministered daily, and their musical service could be called prophesizing. Anyways, uh, it, and if you look in the book of Chronicles, chapters 15, 16, 25, and, and um, and, and chapter 6, you'll, you'll see recordings of, of Asaph as well as, as King David is appointing him uh, in, those, in those special duties of, uh, of position. So we see here that who these people are, and then we'll go ahead and, uh, and, and go into reading the psalm. So if I could have someone read 
verses 1 through 5. I'm sorry, yeah, no. There's an awkward pause there. If someone could read verses 1 through 5, and then someone else, you... I'm sorry, Psalm 77. Um, you got 1 through 5, Jen? All right, and then 6 through 10. Thanks, Ashley. And then 11 through 15. I'm going to pick somebody. In the word of Joshua. You can read, right? All right, 11 through 15, and then if someone can finish out 16 through 20. You got 16 to 20? All right. No, don't worry about it. All right, the reason why I want to share with you guys is because I think the Psalms are just raw. Like, that. I mean, they're, they're everyday people. You know, they're, I, I know we read about who, who Asaph was, and King David, right, has his, has his big, you know, reputation about him. But at the end of the day, you know, I've, I've been reading a book on, on David by Chuck Swindoll, the one that I share with you guys. I have probably about a few more chapters left in it. And, uh, and you, know, we, we, you know, what I think what Ch Chuck Swindoll is trying to say is like, hey, yeah, he... He trusted in the Lord with everything, but he was also a human at the same time. Like, don't, don't, build, don't, put him on this, don't put King David on this pillar of like, man, he was almost perfect, right? He wasn't even close to that. Um, but in, in, in reading the psalm and, and reading that, that, that book on a biography on David, um, you know, and, and just in your everyday life, I, you know, I feel the same way, you know, Asaph did is like, you know, you're like, you know, when, you know, you're, you're just... You just almost sometimes you feel, you know, when you see the news, you're like, man, this, you know, there's, there's no end in sight. You know, when, God, when are you going to come, you know, and, and, and deliver us from this? And you just read as, as the psalmist is writing, and he's just pouring out his feelings, is that, you know, he sees all the troubles in front of him, but then he starts to remember God, God's loving kindness. And then he remembers what, what through Moses, right, what God did to, to the nation of Israel. He brought them out of slavery. He, he, made, he made the empire possible by, you know, clearing the, 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 the Dead Sea or the Red Sea in order, in order for them to cross, you know, providing the quail that, that we read over, you know, a, abundant quail for, you know, for, for the nation of Israel, giving them water, just, just giving them everything that they needed. And, and uh, to me, it's just always, it's always remarkable when I go through the Psalms, you know, every now and then and, and, and read them, um, just because it's so raw and real. Uh, and, and at the end, I think, you know, a lot of them are are, are, are very beautiful. So I just want to share that one with y'all. But anyways, all right. There's something there because they are very raw and real. Yeah. And that is why I've got to call David the man of the mountain. They were the pretense in front of God today. David just opens his heart and so the soul of the spirit of God. 
Yeah, uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll actually is, it's kind of funny. Chuck Swindoll's going over that book. Like he, he preached on these, he, he wrote the book and then he gave a sermon on it, or several sermons on it. And actually Patrick is listening to them right now. Um, and uh, if you go on insight.org, uh, you know, it's, he, they chop up one sermon in, in a three, like 15 minute segments. So um, it's, just, it's just, if anyone wants to read that book, please, you know, once I'm done with it, give me about another week and a half. I'll, you know, just, just call me and, and I'll let you guys borrow it to read it because it's, it's really good. He, he did a very good job of just pulling out lessons that we can learn from David. Um, and it's just quite, quite remarkable. Anyways, all right, Sela. So I looked it up, Jen, because I was wondering too. So, you know, I've never looked it up what that word means. So it's this term of unknown meaning appearing in Psalms outside the book of Psalms, only in, in Habakkuk chapter 3. Scholars have advanced various unprovable theories. A pause either for silence or musical interlude. A signal for the congregation to sing, recite, or fall prostrate on the ground. A cue for the cymbals to crash, a word to be shouted by the congregation, or a sign to the choir to sing a higher pitch or louder. The earliest Jewish traditions thought it meant forever. So they don't know what it means. I mean, that's a long list of possibilities. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Like there's eight, eight possibilities that could be. Yeah. So it's got to be something in the music Yeah. Anyways. I, <laughs> Maybe it is guitar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, apparently Chris plays guitar. So, yeah, there we go. I'm going to throw it out there. And then Ashley plays drums. <laughs> oh, I know. I remember. Yeah, it's, it, it's up in the attic. <laughs> we have two. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she stayed quiet over there. There you go. And Terry sings. There we go. All right. <laughs> All right. So Galatians. Um, Galatians is another letter of Paul. Uh, we'll go ahead and go there right now. It's, it's a little bit different than, than the other letters. Uh, it's different as in, it's the only letter that Paul does not provide like a glorious report. You know, how we saw, you know, Ty saying, hey, Ty, you're doing a good job, you know, blah, blah, blah. Hey, Corinthians, you guys are doing good at this stuff, right? No, Paul just goes straight, he goes straight to the jugular. He just goes straight to the, to, to the throat. It's very fiery. It's very urgent. Um, and I didn't know that until I, until I read through all of it. And I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. And then when you start kind of reading the background of it, you start realizing that, that the sense of urgency is because he, f he feels that the, that the church there is going to go astray. And not by like, you know, by, by, by other means, but, but through the Jewish church kind of going in there and saying, hey, in order to be a Christian, you have to do these Jewish traditions. Um, and Paul's like, whoa, 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 stop. Like, not required at all, right? So he's, there's a sense of urgency in it. Um, and it's urgent because most likely other Jews gave views contrary to what Paul preached. Uh, their teaching centered around the need to supplement faith in Christ with obedience to the law of Moses. So, so just like I said, right? Hey, you have to do these other things that, that are in the Old Testament before being a true Christian. And of course, Paul's like, hey, stop. That is, that is not the case. It's through faith alone and, 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 and in God alone and in Christ alone that, that you become a Christian. You don't have to worry about, you know, following every law, you know, the letter of the law in the book of Moses. He's like, not required. Um, additionally, uh, uh, Paul continuously in this letter preaches that through justification comes from the grace of God and by faith alone in Christ alone. The, so that's, that's the only justification that you need. You don't need to offer sacrifice. It's through faith alone. That's how God will, will, will justify you. All right. Uh, and then I put this letter can be outlined, outlined in, in, in three major sections. All right. One is that Paul defends his apostleship as given directly from Christ and not dependent on Jerusalem or any other, any other of the apostles. And you're going to see that in chapters 1 through through beginning of chapter 3. Uh, you know, Paul saying like, I, I, I was given the apostleship. And we'll go over what, what apostleship means um, as we get into chapter 1. But he says, hey, I was given authority by Christ alone. Like no one, like none of the other apostles said, hey, you're going to be, you know, here's the gospel. Like none of the other apostles 
gave like gave a blessing of, of Paul to preach to the Gentiles. Paul's going to say, hey, it was through my, you know, he, he talks about his road to Damascus, how Christ came, blinded him, knocked him on the ground, and was like, hey, man, what you're doing is wrong, right? You know, why, why, why are you persecuting me? And Paul's saying, hey, I was given the commission by Christ himself. Um, and then he just defends that or, or, or gives reasons that. And it's pretty neat because what we read in the, in the book of Acts, we get a broad, kind of a, a good broad, uh, uh, I guess, br brushstroke of, of Paul starting his, his missionary journeys. But here in Galatians, he, he plugs in a lot of the holes because when you just read Acts, there's, there's like some, some pockets of like, well, what was going on? It makes it sound like, boom, you know, he was blinded. And then, and then the very next day he was out preaching. It doesn't really happen that way. There's, there's a big span, time span of God refining Paul in the desert, you know, by himself, working. And then later on, Paul comes on the scene, when, you know, once, once God has, you know, like, like a, as a Paul says, or Peter says, you know, molds you like a, like a clay pot. I forgot which one says it. Well, one of them says it, right? So it, in that time in the desert, God is molding Paul, getting him ready, getting him ready for, for his, 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 his missionary journeys. Uh, but Paul fills those holes in, in this letter. Uh, the second section that, that, that I kind of made up was in chapters 3 through 5. Uh, Paul is explaining the gospel again, and he's, he's explaining it is through faith alone, through faith alone, right? You don't have to follow the, you know, you don't have to be circumcised, or, or you don't have to do these other things. It's, it's through faith alone. And he explains it very clearly. Um, this is the first time I've truly studied Galatians, and it's, it's kind of neat how uh, how much as, as, you, as you study the Bible, as you mature in the faith, how things seem uh, simple, or simpler, I guess. Uh, and when I was reading Galatians through, you know, chapters 3 through 5, um, it just dawned on me, and, and I realized that this, this is a very simple way of explaining the gospel. And, it, and I was just amazed. I was like, oh man, this is great. Are you going to say something? No, it's Galatians 1. Oh, is it? All right. Well, I hope we don't mess it up. All right. <laughs> um, but again, he, he explains it very clearly, right? He's, he's trying to help the, 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 the church, churches there in Galatia understand, like, hey, guys, this is, this is what faith is. This is what it requires. It doesn't require your works. Like, there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. This is, is through faith alone. And he, he gives examples of Abraham, right? Because, you know, hey, well, I don't want to get too much into it, but it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's, it's great. It's great. It's good stuff. I'm excited about it. Because we all have Thank you. All right. And then the last section is, you can sum it up as Paul's appeal to live by the Spirit. And this is where, in my opinion, it gets, it gets very, well, I guess it's serious throughout, but when I read it, this was probably the most condemning part. It was, was the beginning of chapter 5 and, and, and closing out the end, end of Galatians. Because when I read this, I think of this, you know, as a, as a mature Christian, um, am, I, am I living according to the faith? I'm sorry, am I living according to the Spirit? And as I'm reading it, I'm like, oof, you know, I'm missing the mark. So, specifically in chapter 5, uh, to me was, was the most, I don't know if the word is condemning or, or the most, um, what word do you use? Condemning? Yeah. <laughs> uh, to, me, to me, it was the most condemning. Um, and and we're going we're gonna to spend a lot of time uh, in chapter 5, all right? Uh, but this is a great letter. And, you know, w whether you're a mature Christian or, or young in the faith, we're all going to learn, learn a lot from this letter, and um, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm not excited about James, just because to me that's a hard letter, but I, I, I just want to challenge myself, I guess. I just, yeah, I guess I just want to challenge myself. Um, and, and as Chris texted me one time, he's like, hey, you always got to stay ready, and he's right. So, anyways. All right, Chris, you ready to, uh, to give the overview? Yeah, there you go. That's what it is. All right, because I texted him. I was like, hey, man, are, are you ready to, to give the overview? And he's like, we say it again? Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh man, he's right." <laughs> and I, I was there. The many Christians talk about condemning. Mm. It doesn't mean we we condemn because we are faith. Mm. So I probably better word condemning. Convicting. convicting, convicting. Yeah, that's that's probably that's probably a better way of, of, of putting it. Yeah, not condemning. It's more conviction. 
Um, very strong conviction. But uh, I, I'm excited about this letter. It'll be good. All right, you want the chair or do you want the podium, Chris? Oh, you need this, though. So, in a similar fashion to what we did with Crete, I'm doing with Galatia. Uh, full disclosure here, I didn't really know anything about it beforehand. So, I was learning as I did this. Um, and I also wasn't really familiar with the book of Galatians. I've never studied it. Um, so, all this was new to me. So, let's go to the next slide. All right. So, the first question was, where was Galatia? Um, so, in the first century, it was located on the peninsula between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, and then also between like the Balkans of Europe and the Middle East. So that's, put, that's the peninsula we're talking about. Next slide. In modern terms, where was it? We're talking about Turkey. So that peninsula where Turkey is located, that's where Galatia was at its time. Um, they used to call that peninsula, I believe I have it in a future slide, but it's Antolia or Anatolia. I have the correct spelling coming up here, but geographically it's north of Syria, Lebanon, Israel, etc. Um, it's south of the Black Sea. It's east of where Greece is, Bulgaria, Syria, I mean Serbia, Romania, etc. And then it's south of Ukraine, Georgia, Russia, etc. So that's that's where we're talking about. And then specifically Galatia is in like the center of where Turkey is now, where like the writing Turkey on the map is. All right, so now we got that settled. So the brief history on Galatia. Oh, one moment, let me move on over. If you need me to go back, if you wanna, all right, okay. All right, so brief history on Galatia. It was settled by the Celtic Gauls around 280 BC. What that far? What's up? Celtics went that far. Oh yeah. Well, we're, we're getting there. Spoiler alert. But um, so there was King Nicodemus. He was basically having a feud with one of his brothers in order to win the war and like shift the tides of war. He brought in the Celtic Gauls, which were barbarians from like Europe. So he brought them in. They helped win the war. After the war was won. Um, he then faced a problem set of like, okay, well, what do I do with these people? So then he granted them Galatia. So that's essentially the, the backstory to that. Um, and then the, the Gauls themselves, I'll call them the Gauls, but the Celtic Gauls, if you will. Um, they were like a, a tribal barbarian type of people. So they had various pagan beliefs, various different cultures. Nothing really set in stone. They were kind of nomadic. They were mercenaries. If you watched the, um, the movie Gladiator, like that, the opening battle there, like that gives you the enemies of Rome, that, who they were fighting, like that gives you an idea of who these people were. Um, anyway, so because they didn't really have a whole ton of culture, they were pretty impressionable. So they originally took on the... Uh, the norms, the traditions, and the religions of Greece, which is called be becoming Hellenized. So if you hear the term like before they were Hellenized or post-Hellenization, all that really means is that like Hellenization equals becoming of Greek, essentially. So uh, Latin writers of the area would refer to the Galatians as Greek Gauls, right? And then they were conquered by Rome, ultimately being absorbed into the, the Roman Empire by about 25 BC and then they ultimately took on that culture. So the key takeaway on the history piece is they don't have longevity culturally, right? Like they're very impressionable. Um, they brought in their own culture to this new land, which was formed by war. Then they took on Greek culture, then they were conquered by Rome, and then they took on Roman culture. So their norms, their culture itself, how they function as a society, it continues to change like every quarter of a century. Um, next slide, here we go. So now let's talk about the religion as I already alluded to. They originally had pagan beliefs, 
meaning that they believed in a, a variety of different gods and goddesses, nothing super structured. It was all pretty much like tribe dependent, which god they picked that they favored. Um, they took on Greek culture and religion, and then they, they basically displaced their original pagan gods with the Greek and Roman beliefs, specifically the god of Sab Sabazios. Is that the right pronunciation? Anyway, Sab all right. Sabazios, why he was favored by the, the Celtic Gauls, or the Galatians in this case, was because he was depicted as a warrior on horseback. He wielded a spear and uh, trampled the world serpent that symbolized chaos. Fun fact, the Catholic Church, if you go into like, Catholic churches and you look at their like, stained glass murals, if you will, they feature this one, but they rename it essentially one of the, I think, one of the saints. I, I forget what saint it is, but they have him like a knight in shining army ar armor, like killing a serpent. Yeah, it was actually this. Like, that's where they got the idea from. Um, and then Sabazios was all often associated with Zeus because Zeus had a famous son called Heracles, which is the Roman Hercules, very similar. Um, and that was an already like established savior figure in Anatolia, meaning like Galatia. All right, so the key takeaways from that would be similar to their culture, Galatia doesn't have a long established history of religion either, which once again translates to them being impressionable. I don't want to say a long established history of religion because they, they were always religious in one capacity or another, but it's not like you had generation after generation for centuries or millennia of just one standing religion. They kind of just assimilate it into whatever was going on as they developed. Um, and then the second key takeaway is that I found interesting was Galatia was at the time of Paul's missionary work primed for Christian conversion. And the reason why I say that is because they were receptive to the message of a single all-powerful deity who offered salvation uh, through the belief in his son. Meaning like when they worshiped Sabazios, he was like the all-powerful deity who had um, ultimately his son. And the son was like this warrior savior figure. So they were already believing in a similar message so that when the missionary work started from Paul, they were already receptive to that. They just had to like refine their shock group and get them to believe the truth. That's a, that's a good point. Um, so similar to the, the Cretans, there was a bunch of like ancient writers, Plato, Aristotle being two of the big ones, um, that referred to them as being like the wildest of people. They were known as some of ancient's most like prolific mercenaries. They're celebrated for their size or fierceness. Classical civilizations looked at the Gauls as being, you know, savage warrior people and generally uncivilized. Like I said, they were essentially barbarians that took on Greek culture. Um, culture continuously changed over the three to 400 year span between them entering the area and then the missionary work of Paul. Once again, it was kind of fluid. It was always changing. Um, basically, you have tribal pagan barbarians who became Hellenized and assimilated in the Greek culture, and then they ultimately became Romanized and assimilated in the Roman culture, all over that like 300 year span. The Galatian Celts haven't recorded their own history, which made this kind of challenging because you have to rely on whether it be Greek or Roman literature to find anything out about them. Um, so everything is all based on speculation coming from those classical civilizations. And the last point I already mentioned like several times that 
Due to their lack of cultural and societal foundation, they're highly impressionable to other cultures around them. Next slide. So the similarities between Galatia and Crete is that both of them had similar lineages to like a warrior culture and like gender roles in that aspect with men being originally mercenaries. Both of them took on Greek and Roman cultures and then with that, um, a lot of the men eventually assimilated it from being a warrior into that like trading style profession just because of the times. And then women took on the lifestyle and freedoms often by, offered by Roman culture, similar to the creeds, um, which meant that they had these like non-traditional gender roles and that their familial life wasn't, you know, the ideal Christian setting. And then both were upon conversion to Christianity, subject to gospel contradiction, corruption, and then due to them being Gentiles, the first century Jews who weren't really receptive to the message of Christianity and like the, the conflict with the biblical law um, would force onto them like dietary constraints, circumcision, ritual requirements of the law of Moses, and then also um, yeah, they, they faced Jews openly denying the legitimacy and the authority of any of the apostles or people that were sharing, you know, the word of Christ. And then that takes me into this. So up here I put down the first, like, the three missionary journeys of Paul, a rough timeline, the, like, ten-year span that he did it. And then it also isn't known exactly when the book of Galatians is written. There's a lot of speculation and theories as to, like, when it was or was not, you know, written it in context to the missionary work. Um, but a lot of people tend to believe that he wrote it during his third missionary journey, which was obviously around like AD 54. Um, and the reason for that is like in the first missionary journey, that's when he first obviously went to Galatia, identified and like set up the churches. During the second work, you know, they obviously were starting to build, starting to get influenced by the third one. That's when like they're now facing like corruption. They've had time to like really um, create this problem set that sets the conditions for the you know, the book of Galatians. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's my theory. Jeff, do you have any insight as to like when the book of Galatians was written in reference to these? All right. But I think that's all I got. I don't have any more slides. It's the last one. So does anyone have any questions on what I covered? Is that pretty straightforward? Jenny? So Yeah, it was essentially its own, like, province, but once it got conquered by Rome, then it became part of, like, the Antolia province of whatever it was in, in Rome. Like, and it had its own, like, provincial governor, and then its own, like, district governor, et cetera, by the Roman government. Um, Can you go? Go back, John. I think. Yeah, I think I have on. Wait. If you go to like one of the first slides, yeah, this one might. No, you can't really read it on this screen. You might be able to on yours. But. All right. Any other? Yeah. Also, in Galatia, it wasn't just one, like, Celtic tribe. It was, like, ten different major tribes. Yeah. So, yeah, because once again, it was like King Nicodemus hired the Celtic Gauls, and what that meant is, like, you're hiring a bunch of different families, a bunch of different tribes, and a bunch of different, like, versions of the religion that they all brought in, a bunch of different tribal cultures, like... If you're hiring, let's just say, 2,000 mercenaries, I don't know how many he brought, but if you're hiring 2,000, like, you can imagine how many different families and tribes there are. I, yeah. I they, they, they the Celtic culture. There's no such thing. That's just a particular group of Celts. The Celtic culture varies. It was all across Europe. Yep. In my Poland, always a... In my opinion, the Romans overused the word Celtic because that is one of the broadest terms you can have. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was just the uncivilized people of Europe, <laughs> the nomadic people of Europe. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the only reason that I, I read that they cling to Sabazios was just strictly because like he was this like war, like a war horse utilizing like war god, essentially. And these people also favored horses. And that was like their tactic for like battle. So like, that's just kind of why they cling to him. Um, honestly, I tried researching Sabazios, but there isn't a whole ton on it. Um, 